Hi, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org, here with SiliconANGLE TV's live special coverage of Brocade Tech and An An Analyst Day here at San Jose, California. And we've got a couple of kind of deep thinkers in the networking space uh, where we're going to go talk into some of the reality. So sitting right next to me is Greg Farrow. Um, so people online uh, probably know him for Ethereal Mind is his blog, and he also runs the Packet Pushers podcast where all the true networking geeks uh, go and argue protocols and what's happening in the real world of the networking space. And also is John Hudson, who's the solutioneer uh, on Twitter, I believe, and he, he's also a global uh, architect uh, for Brocade. Uh, Gentlemen, thanks for joining me here on theCUBE. Hey, look, he's real. Yeah. He is real. So, uh, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of knowing Greg for a couple of years. Um, so, uh, you know, Greg is uh, one of those people that online sometimes, he tells the truth. And that sometimes annoys people a little bit. But in reality, he tells the truth. So, he's one of those people that when you get to know him, um, he, he's still Greg but you know, everything it there. It makes so, him very useful. So, uh, you know, I, I, there, there's so many topics. It, it, it's really uh, almost like a renaissance in the networking world. Uh, we said, you know, it's for fun so to be networking it, again. It, it's absolutely fun to be networking. Uh, Jay Shrulal, you know, agreed, yeah. networking's sexy now. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, yep. it, it, it's exciting, but you know, you know, Greg, let yeah. me, uh, one of the things I've been arguing with, with you about, is, in a nice friendly debate, is, yeah. you know, Networking's not the center of the universe. When we go to the software-defined data center, you know, there, there's big pieces. You know, come on, it's the, it's the plumbing. What's the role of networking today, and how is it changing? Okay, so in my view, networking is the definitive platform. So forget VMware, or Hyper-V, or Citrix Xen, or KVM. They're just software platforms for operating systems. The Underneath clients. all of those. Yeah, they're just packet generators. Right? It doesn't really matter what the packet generator, the network is the platform that holds all those things together. And it's, yeah. people tend to forget that because for the last 20 years we've had these really um, crisply defined, well controlled edges between the upper layers and the lower layers. And then in the last five years we've seen that edge collapse. And so as VMware came along and the hypervisor and created a dynamic uh, capability, that broke down those crisply defined separation between the network and the applications that ran above it. So now the network doesn't just see applications as where the servers plug into the Ethernet ports, we now have virtualization and even deeper right the way into the application stack. So the, 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 the whole purpose of networking today is that we're now the platform that supports a dynamic system or a dynamic ecosystem instead of the static system. And that's what's given rise to this SDN topic. So but it was what we always wanted. I mean, I, I remember you know, thinking how ridiculous it was that you know, the, I'd run an application, the application would complain. I would take that information, go to the network, teach the network something. Then the network would do something to the application, the application would complain, and mm. I'd take that information. And it's like, why am I in this equation, right? Like, yeah. why isn't the application just telling the network what it wants, and the network telling the application what it can provide? Yeah. Well, and, and in the past, we've always been able to rely on autonomous protocols. So we've had protocols like OSPF, ISIS, BGP, MPLS, and LDP, and those protocols all worked in a defined way, but they happened all on their own. So the network went in, did some little magic around the CLI, the network self-configured itself according to the rules of the protocol, and then, bang, we were done. And then, in each, if the network broke, then it self-healed. If the network needed updating, it self-updated. If the bandwidth changed, or the, the, you know, whatever it was, now we've got a situation where those autonomous protocols are being impacted by the layer above. And that's where the SDN comes in. Uh, so, and OpenFlow, I think SDN's been coming for a long time, really, hasn't it? Well, no, I mean, you could argue that a lot of what you see in some of the, the larger networks, um, you know, the AT&Ts of the world and so forth, some of the tools that they've developed internally for how they manage mm. very large situations are really precursors to a lot of what's being done now, but they're just, they were done in very proprietary, internal, specific ways to them, right? Mm. And so now it's how do, we, how do we bring that out? Because I mean, I don't know about you, but when I first learned how routing worked, I was very disappointed. <laughs> like, I thought it was much more 
advanced than that. You know, I, yeah. I, thought, I, I and so for me, SDN is is almost a fulfillment of what I always thought no, routing was. Right, yeah. this idea of this very kind of morphable, aware layer that can react to an environment. Right. Yeah. And you know, now getting from A to B isn't you know always as easy as, as, it, as it may appear uh, on the cover of a magazine. But um, you know, this whole concept of you know how do you how do you teach a network new tricks? Yep. Right. So, 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 Greg, you, you were poking a little bit at VMware. W what's your take on the kind of virtualiz virtualized pool and automate uh, when it comes to networking? Is that the right methodology, or is there there a different way we should be looking at how to change networking? Uh, yeah. So you've got to look at networking as networking, not networking as virtualization. So every, most people are framing the networking debate in terms of what. So VMware's doing a much better job of whoring itself into the industry and saying we're the only solution and you should only operate inside of our platform. And VMware tries to market itself as a platform on which everybody else speaks. Yeah, you know, I would actually say that, you know, yes, of course, VMware, like every other, you know, publicly traded company wants to rule the world, but um, they're actually embracing some of the multi-hypervisor and even physical worlds. If you look at the yep. uh, dynamic ops acquisition, then a SEER acquisition, but, but uh, you know, they're point, trying to kind of put their arms around and pull yeah, everybody not deliberately. in. Yeah, but yeah. to your yeah. point, it, the, VMware is now a very, I mean, I remember friends complaining when they were at 6,000 people, right? Now they're like 13,000 plus, right? So you now have groups doing, I mean, I did a presentation a couple weeks ago with, um, with a, a, a great guy, uh, Jad, from, um, from the Navy team for VMware, and then um, who was the, at the time the VP of federal sales for NYSERA, uh, and it was right before the acquisition became official, right? And so the guy from NYSERA is up there talking multi-hypervisor and you know, you know, lots of open environments, right? And then the VM, the, you know, the guy that was from original VMware was able to say yes, but within that construct, we think that our version of it is best, right? So you can have some coexistence of this idea of, we'll allow you to pick whatever flavor you want, but chocolate's best, and this is why we think chocolate's best, right? Yeah, I, I think VMware's sort of realized is that IT infrastructure is actually bigger than VMware. VMware's got a nice slice of it, but they can't beat Linux. Microsoft couldn't beat Linux, they couldn't defeat Linux, and the open source movement. Well, it, it, it's interesting to say that. So, uh, you know, I talked to Martin uh, Casado, mm -hmm. uh, one of the co-founders of, uh, uh, of NYSERA, and I, I know, you know you saw the interview we did, and, mm -hmm. and he actually was banging on the table, you know, we're going to change networking, yep. and he said, there's open source projects, and there's open standards. Mm -hmm. And there's room for both of them, but I hope the standards die, is basically yep. what he said. You know, what's your take on that? Um, that's, that's nice. I'm sure he'll enjoy that. The, the open source um, usually um, self-explodes. It just reaches a certain point. It requires a benevolent dictator to hold a coherent, coherent story together. So in the same way that VMware's managed to make an ecosystem by having a consistent story, develop a product, and they've managed to you know, own a certain percentage of the industry, the only reason that Linux has been successful in all of its various forms in the open source movement is that somebody becomes the benevolent dictator to hold okay, the pitch. And, and gives you an 800 number that you can call when things yeah. go so wrong. So Linus Torvalds right? doesn't write the whole kernel, but he holds the kernel together. All right, so, you so know, do, Rudo, do, uh, you, do you not buy that then VMware can be you know, driving an open source project? and no. uh, you know, has, has the skills no, for that? No, EMC now. doesn't have that sort of um, DNA. Well, I said VMware. But well, EMC is VMware. Yeah, and, VMware and I would agree is, that is 100 an EMC company. So EMC wants to promote the picture that at, VMware at is. At some level, yeah. a company may try very, very hard and very honestly to support an open source movement. But at a very fundamental level, that is a cost center, yes. right? That is a business unit expending company resources that generates no perceivable income. It may generate goodwill, it may generate indirect income, but no perceivable, and so it's very hard for them to survive through the ebbs and flow of a business cycle. Right. When things get tough, yep. open source movements get hurt. Well, John, so you work on standards. And you know, so Try. isn't it the same? I mean, standards is one of those things. You know, it, it's kind of boring to most people. They don't understand it. it takes years to do it, but and it's a it's a time sink for uh, well, the, you know the vendors yeah, involved. Yeah, but you got to realize that there there's really three different groups of us in, in in for example the IETF where I work, where you have you have the academics, right? You have the people that are there for the love of the algorithms and the love of, of the mathematics, right? And then you have the the real vendor folks that are really there to use standards to kind of get take advantage of vendors. And then you have a, another group that, that I, I consider myself part of, which is 
people who used to be operators who know what it's like to be abused by a proprietary protocol and really fundamentally believe in standards, right? Yeah. Like, don't see it as a, as a, as a, as a positioning thing. It's a, yeah. this is how you protect little people, right? Yeah. This is standards. how you keep people from being abused. A network is far bigger than just VMware. VMware is a minuscule little animal that sits in, the, in, the, in this little data center space, but networks are global entities, internet. They're, they're they thousands influence each more, other greatly. And they're all interlocked in a way that VMware can't, that, that, that a hypervisor system can't. Like vCenter doesn't scale beyond 50,000 nodes, whereas the internet is already a half a million nodes. Yeah. And I'm just counting the routers, not counting the, you know, the edge points and all the, the computers that connect to it and that sort of stuff. You can't have open source in that because there's no one person who can carry the initiative in a sustainable way. Which you have to have a team so, so, so that the banner can pass from person to person to person and that's where open standards yeah. supersede open source. Now, if you've got a tightly bound problem space, like Python or PHP yeah. or the Linux kernel, which is nicely, then you can have a dictator, you know, a dictatorial type of capability which can focus and take leadership. Often benevolent, but a dictator nonetheless. Yeah, or, or a fundamental core that can hold the vision yeah. together over, as you say, over the ebbs and flows of the business cycle. One thing that we know about networking and open standards is 30 years later, they really, really work, right? <laughs> yes. So how many open source projects have lasted 30 years? that have been taken over by leader after leader after and that, leader. And that doesn't always mean you get the best solution, mm. right? Mm. Sometimes it means that it's better to pick the solution that isn't actually the best solution if it means wider adoption, right? Mm. I mean, you can look at a lot of different protocols, um, you know, 802.11 and others where essentially, you know, I'm not saying that there weren't better solutions to the technical problem presented, but for whatever reason, that instance of it became what enough people wanted to use that we benefit more from the wide adoption of it than we do from the perfection of it as an individual. Okay, yeah. so, so, so guys, with the limited amount of time we have left, I want to bring us back to today. Both yeah. of you talked to, you know, Greg, you architect Real Solutions, and yeah. in your community, you know, are the, are the folks in the field I used that, to are, work for that are putting there, <laughs> and, and John, you know, I know you're talking to those end user customers, so, you know, I want to run through a couple of topics, and you know, where are we today? So, so Greg, I'll start with you. You know, the whole, you know, layer two multipathing, whether it be Trill or SPB or other solutions, you know, what's the maturity of that today and, and what, what are you hearing from people deploying it in the field? Um, it works. People are using it. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it. I think we've sort of got through, you've got to remember that Trill's already 10 years old? Uh, Just close to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah nearly yeah. 10 years. Yeah, yeah, getting there, so yeah. The Trill idea has been wandering around for a decade. Um, we're finally getting to the point where there's actually a clear, so somebody's been quite Prescient and Rowdy Pillman led the first years, you know, the, the initiative. Five years later, we're finally, you know, ten years later, we're finally into the point where it's met the requirement. So a lot of these people can envision these problems long before most software companies have even envisioned that there's actually a need. Um, and you have a nice common thread between the three of them, uh, you know, for me being SPB, Trill, and, mm -hmm. and some kind of an MLAG type scenario, right? In that you're trying to kill active passive links. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you paid for it, you want to use it, right? So yeah, so tr the layer two multipath fundamentally changes the equation. Half of our data networks today are dead because they're redundant paths for something else, but they're shut down and unused. Yeah. So 50% of your networking asset is dead money. Which so is madness. Layer two multipath lights that up. As soon as you mention that, everybody goes, right, how do we get onto that? Yeah. So people are starting to deploy that. Cisco's been pushing their fabric path along. Yep. But Brocade's VCS is quite interesting to me because uh, the automation that they've put into that, uh, is it, uh, quite, quite, there's a lot of uniqueness into VCS in terms of what it can do in terms of automatic load balancing, back pressure, link bundling, and so forth. It's, it's, you've got to, and the funny part about it is if you actually configure a VCS, you kind of just plug it in and say VCS there, and it's done, and there's all this magic happening under there and you don't know about it. But if you're a, a networking nerd, you just sort of scratch away it and you go, wow, and then you scratch away it and go, oh, they thought about that too, hang on. And that. Well, okay. yeah. so, 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 John, you know, the customers you're going to see, um, a lot of times customers are reticent to adopt new technology. Is there anything that you said, you know, I, I just wish if I, they, they would all deploy this feature or activate this, you know, it's going to make their lives a lot easier. What, what aren't customers doing that they should be doing today to make their lives easier? I, I would say that what, what they're doing a really bad job of in general is, is handling the, the human process element of it in the, you know, the, the idea, the concept, to touch on VMware, of telling a VM, 
and, and infrastructure, you need these resources. And if you can't get them here, you go elsewhere and find them, it's fantastic. But the truth of the matter is, if most IT directors walked into a data center today and asked where is the Oracle server, and the admin went, ah, I don't know, last week it was over there, <laughs> it wouldn't go over very well, yeah. right? So there, there's, a, there's a mind gap between how much nimbleness is available and then how comfortable people really are in a world where you're used to having a data center number with a rack number, with a shelf number, with a MAC address, with an ID, with a software license, right? Yep. And so there's a, there's a lot of great technology available and people are, are having a hard time adopting it because of change control policies and, and, and you know, all the different things that we've kind of wrapped around IT data centers and so yep. it, it's, it's, it's making change very difficult. That's, the other problem here is that management needs to change. So the actual IT management people need to come and meet the technology people as much as the technology people need to come and meet the managers. Right now we've got a big problem in networking where network managers are saying, I want this, but I'm not going to do anything to get there. Mm. I've either got to spend, I've got to change my thinking, do something different. So Greg, I've got a bunch of service providers here and Brocade seems to be making some good inroads there. Yep. Um, I, I believe you have some uh, maybe concerns about you know just, just moving our network kind of out to, to, to service providers. You want to, any commentary on that? <laughs> I'm not 100% sure what you're driving into there. So, so, so I'm saying, you know, should I, should I manage it in-house and change the way I'm doing things, or do I just yeah, do, I, go to so a service? I, right so. now I believe that the only way you can make data center networking work for your company today is to do it yourself. Because there's so much going on in the data center space, there's so much vectoring of change, the speed of change is so fast, and the, the, the market's changing tech. If you outsource that, you lock yourself into a technology which might be a dead end and you but, could be. But that requires that IT organization to recognize that they can be a benefit yep. and not just a, 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 a treading water model, right? Mm. Looking for ways that an IT, you look at someone like, um, you know, like a Netflix or, or someone where, you know, their IT processes have really made them more competitive yep. in their market space. And if IT organizations aren't stepping away from just keeping the lights on, and really looking for ways to innovate and become better assets to the organization, then that outsourcing is a lot more likely. I guess my point is, um, today there's so much change going on and it can make a big difference to your business. You need to do that, it needs to be very close to where you are. Now, for example, 10 years ago, say 2000, 2001, you needed to do your own WAN because you needed to customize that WAN to meet your mm -hmm. requirements. But somewhere in the mid 2000s, WANs became commodity, standardized, flat. So I'm perfectly happy to take my WAN and give that to an outsourcing provider because there's no innovation happening there. I can't, it can't deliver any value to my business. So just give that away, maximize the price, minimize the cost, yep. maximize the benefit to the business. Yep. It's yep. static, it's unchanging, outsource that. Yep. Right? Desktops, outsource that yep. if you're going to stick, unless you're going to go into VDI, whole new argument, right? Yep. yep. In data center networks, you've got to realize that there's a whole great ch opportunity for change going on. So outsourcing your data center. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss everything. Yeah. So even if you push your stuff into Amazon, there's so much speed of change happening in the Amazon space, you're going to kill yourself because you're going to take a stake in a technology set and then you're going to find that Amazon is different. And well, then you're now, now you're relying on them to be innovative. Yeah, so, right? so, so, so guys, we're running out of time. There's one thing, you know, I mean, obviously the big news of the week was the iPhone 5. <laughs> Second, you have the, you the, know, the, I, the VDX 8770. I, I yeah. tried to order it, I know. didn't order it till uh, Friday. Two more yeah. days, you, you, you'll, you'll be able to order it. But IDF's going on this week, and Intel made an interesting network announcement. Talk about really taking the fabric and pulling it in. I mean, Intel's, you know, for years been working with a broad ecosystem and slowly moving functionality in. They made some big acquisitions with Fulcrum Micro, uh, InfiniBand from Juniper, uh, you know, the, the company Q -Logic. that- yeah, Q Logic. sorry, uh, uh, thank you. And so, you know, Greg, first take on, uh, you know, what, what's Intel doing and what's it mean for the networking world? Meh. 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 So what, you know, they put DPDK into the chipset? Uh, uh, all right. I, I, would argue, I would argue that it might be in all of our best interest to go to Intel, ask for forgiveness, and hope that they're benevolent when they finally take over your market. <laughs> um, um, you know, they, they are a phenomenal organization with a lot of really brilliant people, and if they want to get good at something, they will. And so I think it's very interesting, but I, I also think it's a little, a little scary. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it, um, it's it, interesting. Of course, you know, VMware's moving to take over more of networking. Intel now mo moving into that space. There, there are lots of companies. You know, it, it's not just Cisco and the traditional networking companies. It's, it's coming from yeah. all sides of the. But staff. if anyone's going to build Skynet, yeah. Well, if you want, if you want to prognosticate, yeah. so if imagine if Intel uses the DPDK uh, extensions to actually build a switch inside the CPU. So how are you going to configure that switch? Are you going to do it with Web Vepa, or are you going to use 
um, something a fixed model? Yeah, yeah. Or are you going to use some other, you know, VN Which tag? is where so many companies go wrong because they get started from the technology, they don't pay attention to the to the OAM, the care and feeding. Yeah, How are right. you going to administer it? Are you really paying attention to the workflow models of, mm -hmm. the, of the of the customers you're yep. you're trying to approach the technology with? Yeah. So if you imagine today, Cisco's got their uh, MKA one uh, chipset going on, the Palo chipset on their adapters in their fancy UCSs. So if you imagine that chipset coming into the Intel CPU, what does that do to the server market? So instead of actually having a fancy adapter, there's actually a switch inside the Intel chipset, but how are you going to configure that? How does that integrate? So my question is, meh, because Intel's not laying out a, a strategy to say, this is how we'll integrate with VMware and Citrix. And, and what does the that network. do to competition and innovation and, and other things, right? I mean. Yeah. You know. I don't think it changes. It changes what happens in the hypervisor, in the sense that instead of having a virtual switch, or instead of using a network adapter to provide virtual switching functionalities, there'll be some subset. And I imagine that in long term, it'll be like the Intel graphics adapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. get the uh, the uh, the bare minimum. Yeah, the, right. The low performance yeah, 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 is on the chip. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is in the CPU, and then yep. out. Then you put in a fancy if one you need outside. The high end, you, you augment. So yeah, yeah. yeah, that that I imagine that in the end, and Intel. That's not a bad will, model. You know, perfect. Yeah, yeah. And you might be able to say, if I'm Google, I can make the most of that. Sure, that sure. I can make that fit my business model. Do some fancy programming, and away I go. And but if I want some, I want to be in the enterprise, and I want it to stand up and beg like a little doggy, and then yep. brush my shoes, yep. and uh, give me a hairbrush in the morning. Yep. Then I'll go and buy a fancy adapter, yep. and it, and the market will be unchanged. Right. Yep. That'll be exactly the same as what we've got today. So, uh, guys, we, we are running out of time here. <laughs> uh, before, as we wrap up, you know, what what I really like is, I, I've had a lot of these conversations with you guys you know, online, through blogs, through Twittersphere, you know, in person, and we're going to keep the conversation going online. Yep. So, um, you know, Greg, you're like the Howard Stern of the networking, <laughs> you're the king of all media, <laughs> you're found on network computing, uh, ethereal Are mind, the packet kind of pushers <laughs> podcast, <laughs> and he does drop an F-bomb every now and then. So, you know, wh where's the best place for people to find you? Uh, you can find me on my blog at etherealmind.com or on the packet pushers at packetpushers.net. I'm on Twitter as at Ethereal Mind. All right, and, and John, you're, you're blogging on the Brocade site? I, I, I occasionally get something published on the Brocade community site, and uh, as you mentioned before, the Solutioneer on Twitter, and um, if you buy enough, I get to come visit you. Excellent, <laughs> so, so gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org, here with continuous coverage from Brocade Tech Day in San Jose, California. We'll be right back after with our next guest. <laughs>